translator, I run a history website that works fine. So that's what my background is in, in this, like, into my history and I love it as a passion, but I love the passion for history. But when we start about, um, I'm going to talk about William Roach and his hanging gardens. But to get to talk about William, his hanging gardens, we need to find out who William Roach was in the first place and you know, how his gardens came to be. <coughs> William Roach was born in 1775 into a wealthy Catholic family. And that itself it was an interesting. Sorry. Sorry. I was just saying that um, William Roach, he was born in 1775 into a wealthy Catholic family. And that in itself was an interesting thing as there wasn't very many wealthy Catholic families in Limerick during that period. It, it wasn't, the Catholics could not own their own property within Limerick at that time. It wasn't until seven, until seven years after William was born that a Catholic could own their own property. So quite unusual that he came from this. His um, mother was the heir to uh, large estates up in Chum in County Galway and in Rathkeel in County Limerick. So his father's family were all merchants and his mother's family were these estate holders. So he came from quite an affluent background. His father's family, as they were merchants and they were in Limerick for at least two generations back, his grandfather was John, he imported and exported. Goods from Limerick. His father was Stephen and his uncle was Philip. His uncle Philip uh, built the um, Mardike warehouse, which we know today is the granary. And even when you go down to the granary today, you can see there's a stone plaque on the wall that says uh, Michael Street, 1787, which was the year that Philip Roach, William's uncle, built this, um, this warehouse, which is it's quite interesting. It was only five years after the Catholics could own land in Limerick that this family were able to do this much. William had many brothers, and these brothers all went off to do their own interesting, quite interesting things. Um, his brother George went to Bordeaux to set up a wine import from exporters. After a few years there, his another brother, James, followed George to Bordeaux. He first, James was educated in France as well in, from the age of 15, but he followed with his brother into that business for a few years. After, it, this was a, a period that was, you know, there was heightened political upheaval in France as well. It was coming up to the French Revolution. And as a result of James being in France in that period, he was arrested for being a, a part of the uh, British Empire, being a British citizen in France, and he was imprisoned in France for six months. Eventually he was freed and came back to Ireland, where he went to Cork with his brother Stephen. And they set up a bank in Cork in 1800. William was still up in Limerick at this time with another brother of his, Thomas, and they followed the same suit as their brothers in Cork. They opened a bank first in Charlotte's Quay in 1801, and in 1804 they moved. They had a big advert in the paper saying the bank of Thomas and William Roach was to be opened on George Street, which is O'Connor Street now. And this is where we, we move on a, a little in, in their lives. This is where Thomas and William would set up their bank and the, for the beginning of the, the gardens. Before I get on to where the gardens were, you need to know a little bit more about, about William again, because he was a very interesting character. He was a, a political activist. He was born the same year as Daniel O'Connell. And he was a good friend of Daniel O'Connell's. Whenever Daniel O'Connell came to Limerick, he would stay with William. 
he had he was a, a major player in rights for the Catholics. He was a head in the um, St Michael's Parish collective that would were voicing uh, for rights for Catholics. He became the first Catholic Limerick MP, which again was another major feat as you could not vote unless you owned or rented property of over £10 during this period. And as Catholics could not own land until relatively recently in that time, it meant that it was his, uh, his Protestant friends who must have been voting for him to become the first Catholic MP. There was, there was a lot... His, his political career spanned 10 years. He started in, in 1932 and went to 1941, almost 10 years. And while he was there, not only did he fight for Catholic rights, he was a, a very vocal about the abolition of slavery and the rights of uh, Jewish people as well. You know, it was, he would put his own stance onto it as coming from someone who knew of the oppression of his of his religion, of what was put onto him, he could help other people during that time. He was a he was a, an ally of, as I said, of Daniel Connell, and he would often be raising funds in Limerick for Daniel Connell. There was a letter that he, he gave out in um, St. Michael's Parish in 1844 you know, to try and raise funds to keep the the Catholic emancipation alive to make sure that this went forward, that all Catholics had the same rights as all Protestants. And the letter it reads from St. Michael's Parish. We the undersigned request a meeting of the parishioners of St. Michael's at the vestry to make arrangement for the effective collection of our annual debt to our beloved liberator and martyr, Daniel O'Connell. It's interesting that they, they used martyr at that stage as he, it was three years later, it was three years after this letter was written, that Daniel O'Connell actually died in Italy, but he had been, he had left Ireland at this stage. Never was there a time when it was more necessary to prove our unaltered attachment to the great leader than the present. We therefore are certain that every lover of his native land would be prompt in his exertion on this occasion. So you can see, he wasn't, he, there was no self-absorption in him for his garden <coughs> It was, he was all about his land, his people, his, his heritage going on. He, he, was a, he was a magistrate in Limerick as well, and he often was brought into the, the courts for different aspects of, um, of law and especially when it came to banking. As we said, they moved their bank to Georgia Street, O'Connell Street now. They were there from, they started the bank in 1801, but in 1820 and 1819 and 1820 there was a huge bankers crash in Ireland. It almost obliterated banks, small banks in Ireland. The, his brother's bank in Cork was wiped out. And they, they had to file for bankruptcy in Cork. Uh, Bruce's bank was also gone. I like to think it was because of um, Bruce's attitude. He, uh, there was a, a story that I heard that um, the owner of Bruce's bank had an iron leg. And if somebody couldn't repay their debts, he had this fourth, fourth thorn stick that he would use to hobble around. And they'd come in and they'd say, oh, I can't pay my debts this week. And he'd take his horse and stick and whack it off his leg, making the resounding sound, and say, this is the softest part of me. Yeah. So I'm sure that that played a part into why he was one of the ones who fell, whereas William Roach, William and Thomas Roach, they fell for their community, so their community had the backing, they, they backed with their community. They had their bank on um, Georgia Street, but they also played a part in their community. Once again, the, the Linen Hall was where flax merchants and 
Warner merchants would all come and exchange their goods. And every Monday between 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock, they held a savings bank there. So people who were coming in from the, the countryside only on that one day in a week would have the opportunity to put a, a few shillings away for themselves in savings bank. Which I'm sure had a great deal to do with why they survived. After the crash, you know, they became a little bit disillusioned with the banking system. So by it, it was 1824, they were the only bank in Limerick. But in 1825, it was a provincial bank set up and they merged. So the provincial bank took over Roaches Bank. And later on, in later years, the provincial bank would become AIB. So we did still have a hang on from um, the Roaches Bank in Limerick. Is still here in the form of AIB. Now we get on to his gardens. facility in uh, George Street. It covered about an acre of land from the back of George Street to Henry Street. At the time people were calling it a folly, but it wasn't a folly. You know, he was he was a smart man. He knew how to manage his money. You know, even though this bank cost fifteen thousand pounds to construct, which would be the equivalent of about six hundred thousand euros. It wasn't something that he thought of lightly. He made sure that there was a there was something that was going to come from it, apart from his own pleasure. He built stores underneath, and these he rented out to the, the city council. That um, they had a bond of ten thousand pounds, so he already had back what he had, almost what he had put into it, and it was a continuous lease. On them as well, so it wasn't the huge folly that people thought it was going to be. I'll um, read a piece from um, the Limerick Almanac from 1838, which was written at the time when the gardens were in their fullest. Roach's Garden, Henry Street. The hanging gardens of Limerick bear testimony to the taste of the projector and proprietor, William Roach, Esquire, MP one of the city's representatives. Those gardens extend from the rear of Mr. Roach's house on Georgia Street to Henry Street, occupying about an acre of ground. They are formed on arches varying in height from 25 to 40 feet. Flights of stairs lead from one elevation to another. The terrace sides are 50, 150 feet long by 30 feet wide. The central one is about 800, 180 feet long by 40 feet wide, and the lower 200 feet long and 100 feet wide. It's hard to even imagine, though there's a lot of numbers in it, there's a lot of sizes, it's hard to imagine the extent that that was. Anybody who walks that length of Lower Glenford Street from O'Connell Street to Henry Street can you, you can almost imagine how the, the steps you'd have to take to get from one end to the other. Inside in the gardens too, though, it wasn't just a straight level. It was all on terraces. He had separate terraces for each of his separate gardens. So it was, even though it was an acre, it felt like a lot more. <coughs> the top of the terrace highest terrace wall is about 70 feet above the street and it commands an extensive view of the Shannon surrounding country. It, on that top terrace though, what it fails to mention here is just to the rear of his gardens there were the houses of Lord Perry and the Bishop of Limerick and behind them again they had beautiful gardens in their own right. So when you were inside in his garden, high above the street, 
street level. You had a view out over more beautiful gardens before you reached the Shannon, and on the other side of the Shannon, it was a bare existence, so it was beautiful just scenery from, from there out. Just want to make sure I get right what it was that he grew.
a glass observatory where people could come and watch rotations of the stars in the middle of the city. You couldn't really do that with street lights today, but it wasn't unusual. It wasn't. It was not the only thing that they had. We didn't have cameras back then. <laughs> William Roach, he never married and he never had any children. Why he built the garden in the first place? because even though his family had lands out in Repeal and up in Shoe, that wasn't for him. He wanted something in the city. He wanted to spend his time in his bank and he wanted somewhere he could enjoy himself. It was his, that was his, his, the main purpose of the garden, was so that he could enjoy himself. So I'm sure when, you know, it might have been a deciding factor when Daniel O'Connell was coming down to Limerick that he would go up and wander through this garden at the same time. He died in um, 1850, and, and all his brothers and sisters, they all lived quite extensively. They all lived into their 70s and 80s, which you know, by the time was another unusual aspect, that, that this family, unique in, in their ways, could have that sort of longevity. Um, I'm going to read from his obituary that was put into the, the uh, Limerick Chronicle. This morning, at his residence in Lower Glenbrook Street, by this stage, the, he, his door for his house was on the side of the, the gardens of the entrance. Instead of being on the face where O'Connell Street is now, it was on the side of Lower Glenbrook Street. William Road, Esquire, late MP of the city and magistrate of the borough, also life commissioner of St. Michael's and the president the Limerick Institute. It's not surprising that he didn't have time to get married and have children when he was doing all of this as well. He spent some of his time in London too. He had a residence in London where he would be going backwards and forwards trying to get, with Daniel O'Connell as well, trying to get uh, the rights of, the, of representation from an Irish Catholic in the British Parliament. The demise of this highly respected gentleman whose life for half a century has been closely identified with the welfare of Limerick and warmly devoted the best interests of Ireland, must explicitly an expression of universal sympathy and regret from his countrymen. These expressions weren't just for his death. There was many voices before he died saying the same things, saying, this is a good man. This is a man that should be noted, that should take note. And he was on par, as I said before, with Daniel O'Connell. He was born the same year as Daniel O'Connell. He represented his county as the only Catholic at the same time and was fighting for the same things. But yet, everybody knows the name of Daniel O'Connell. Many people would never have heard of even with his guards, even with something so unique as that, people would not have heard the name William Roach. It's not commonplace. His, inte his, inte his intellectual endowments were of an 
eminent order and derived an additional luster in public as well as private society from a patriotic sentiment, refined courtesy, and a genuine benevolent heart. Mr. Roach was the first Roman Catholic gentleman in Ireland to be appointed to the Commission for Peace for a Corporate Borough, and he was elected member of his native city in December 1832, which he continued to represent in three parliaments. As I said, the voting, the people who were voting him in were not of, of his religion, they were not of his background. So he was a man who was so very well respected and noted and known to be put forward. Mr. Roach took leave of public life in July 1841. It was a remarkable instant in his political career that when pressed to declare himself a repealer upon the eve of an election, and when his return was threatened by the champions of that measure, the late Daniel O'Connell declared in Limerick, William Roach was the only man in Ireland from whom he would not demand a pledge. Which, it says a lot, you know. He was the only man that Danny O'Connell could rely upon, could say, I've got this man, this man, I trust him, I believe that what he stands for is good. You know, that After he died in 1850, his gardens remained there for a, a few years, but he had no children. There was nobody to carry on the legacy. And they started to, to decay, as they would, with nobody tending. And soon they just fell in upon themselves and were, were removed. The stores remain there. You can see the arches of the stores. And these stores were known for how well they were built. And it was a testament to that that the, during the, um, the Second World War, the Department of Defence decided that those stores would be a perfect air raid shelter. I'm sure it had to do with the, the uh, many inches of flagging and cementing that went on, but that was over a hundred, that was about 140 years after they had been built, that they were still seen as so, such a structural integrity that they could be used to defend against air raids. I know a number of years ago they were going to um, <coughs> rebuild, but that went on the wayside with many things. But if you went down there, you can actually see, when you go down to Henry Street and look at these arches, you can see the, the vaulted ceilings. You can see the support that they gave. And it's important to make sure that you know what was there. Try and visualize it. Try and visualize 70 feet high gardens facing you when you're standing opposite the garden station. 